Good morning. This is uh, the new uh, seminar from uh, IAA. Today, uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Xavier Barsons. He's the European Southern Observatory General Director. And he will talk about the X-ray astronomy for non-X-ray astronomers. Uh, Isabel Marquez will introduce him properly. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. And first of all, thank you, Xavier Barcons, for accepting to give us a, a seminar today in these special days for mainly two reasons. The one is concerning the whole world, and the second one is concerning the Spanish uh, more um, uh, specifically, which is the, the, the proximity to holidays. So thanks a lot, uh, a lot uh, Xavier. Uh, Xavier, as uh, René has just said, is the ESO Director General since the 1st of uh, September 2017. He, he got his bachelor's and, and math, math, master's degrees in physical science is in the University of Barcelona and then uh, the PhD in the University of uh, Cantabria, uh, where later he got a, a position as teaching assistant and then a lecturer. Then he got a postdoctoral fellow for two, two years in the Cambridge University in the United uh, Kingdom, where uh, he got then, and I mean, he spent there as a sabbatical visitor in 97. And meanwhile, he got a permanent position in the CSIC, in the Spanish Council for Scientific Research in 93 as a senior research scientist. And then he became a professor, research professor in 2002. Uh, Barcon's research has been focused on astronomy at X-ray wavelengths and until the late 90s, visitor object absorption lines in the intergalactic medium. He has both participated in and led a number of research projects, some of which have provided a backbone of XMM Newton solids. His interests have uh, unveiled obscured active galactic nuclei, AGN, in the distant universe, the evolution of the AGN population and the apparent mismatch between X-rays and optical views of AGN. And then I've, I, I, I've written here in Wolfface the, the word pioneer, because his, his, he really is. In the late 80s, he started the first X-ray astronomy group in Spain, which has been a partner in many international collaborations and consortia. His group is now uh, engaged in and even leading various programs that have obtained large amounts of observing time with a number of observing facilities. It is at ESO, at GTC, XMM, Newton, Spitzel, Wise, and Elmer, among others, to better understand the nature of AGN and their relationship with galaxy information. Much of Vacon's efforts have been uh, directed towards pursuing large projects, beginning as a co-investigator with the XMM Newton Solid Science Center in 96. He has actively pushed for large X-ray observatory missions, including Zeus, IXO, when it merged with NASA's CONX, and most recently is as Athena mission. Before becoming ESO Director General, uh, Bacon served with ESO in many different roles, including ESO Council President from uh, 1812 to 1814. He has dedicated significant effort to help progress major ESO projects, including ALMA and the ELT, which was approved during his mandate as ESO Council President. Barcons has co-authored over 250 refereed papers in journals and conference proceedings. He has supervised uh, the research of more than seven PhD students, given over 100 talks at international conferences and symposia, and chaired and served on the scientific organizing committee of more than 50 international conferences. And just to, to end up with uh, uh, an asteroid is uh, called under his name. So thank you very, very much, Xavier. Now he's uh, talking to, about X-ray astronomy for non-X-ray astronomers. Thanks a lot and, and welcome. Thank you very much, Isabel, for the kind words and thanks, René, for organizing this. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm overwhelmed about the long presentation uh, by Isabel, who is someone who have, I have met and cultivated a good friendship for many years. Um, now, I have to apologize uh, to the many people that I have seen are following this talk and who know uh, probably more than I do about what I'm going to uh, talk about uh, during the next 50 minutes or 40. Um, uh, uh, this, this talk, uh, it's um, a slightly recycled version of one that I gave at ESO um, about a year and a half ago, which was uh, tailored um, uh, basically for engineers um, but also for astronomers who are not very familiar with X-ray observations, and and this is this is the uh, this is the turn of the uh, this is the, the pitch of of 
of the presentation. So for those of you who are very familiar with X-ray observations, which I have seen several of you, please um, forgive me for um, stating very obvious things. Um, and uh, okay, having said that, I believe this is time to start. Um, okay, uh, here we go. So that's, that's um, yeah, I mean, you, you of course, the, you are all very familiar about the spectrum of light. I haven't added here the particle dimension into um, the type of information that we get from the universe, but this is also becoming more and more relevant nowadays. Um, uh, but even if we look at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, we see that uh, there's a wide variety of facilities that we need to gather these observations, this information from the universe. And those facilities look very, very different uh, depending on the wave band. Some of them are in the ground, others are in space uh, for good reason. And uh, that, that makes the whole thing um, uh, quite um, challenging but uh, very necessary to understand uh, physical phenomena in, in astronomy. So uh, I'm going to talk about X-rays, about X-ray observations that, of course, they need to be done uh, from space. Um, uh, the Earth atmosphere is opaque to X-rays <clears throat> below an altitude of about 80 kilometers or so. So we need to fly other, either globes or um, uh, better, uh, space uh, devices in orbit uh, to uh, observe X-rays from the outside of, of the Earth. And this is why uh, X-ray astronomy only started to, to pop up when we uh, were able to send our devices uh, beyond the, uh, the shield of the atmosphere. Um, uh, there is um, actually an official birthday for X-ray astronomy, which is the 18th of June of 1962 when uh, a group of people at uh, a U.S. Uh, company, ASC, um, under the leadership of uh, Bruno Rossi and Ricardo Giacconi, were able to fly <clears throat> a, a rocket uh, with a small payload. Um, it's uh, this, this thing that you've got on the right-hand side. Um, this was um, um, above the 80 kilometers altitude, uh, so it would see the X-ray sky for the first time during five minutes. Um, the uh, um, instrumentation that this, this uh, rocket had was very rudimentary. It had three X-ray detectors. Um, by the way, for those of you who have the chance at some point of visiting the um, Air and Space Museum in, in Washington, uh, which is now sitting um, actually uh, next to the Dulles Airport, there's this, um, there's a spare of this, of this thing uh, in there, and you can watch it and almost touch it, which is, for me, it was very emotional when I, when I could do this a couple of years ago. So um, the declared uh, goal of that uh, very short mission was to detect the X-rays reflected in the moon, so the albedo of, of the moon. And of course, the expectation was that this was all that they were going to see. There was no hope to see any stars in X-rays because judging from the sun, and if you compute the optical to X-ray uh, flux ratio from the sun, there was no expectation that they would ever see X-rays from anything else other than the sun or at best uh, the sunlight reflected uh, on the surface of the moon. But uh, thankfully, uh, reality was very different. Um, Actually, this, uh, those are the two of the three detectors that work during this short minutes of uh, spinning of the rocket about the atmosphere. And um, what they saw was basically two things. One was um, uh, the X-ray background, a uniform um, radiation in X-rays coming from everywhere in the sky, uh, which uh, we know today that it comes from the integrated emission uh, from active galactic nuclei. And they also saw this huge source, this huge X-ray source um, that was named uh, SCOR X1 because of the position in the sky. And that, of course, it was totally unexpected. And uh, the albedo from the moon was not seen at, at that time. Um, it, it was deemed to be too faint. Now, um, one of the subsequent uh, rocket flights had a slightly better detector and it could position 
the source X, score X1 a bit better. So what you have on the right hand side is actually Schmidt plate. And uh, what you have under this uh, red arrow is SCO X1, which is a rather inconspicuous optical source, but it's, it's the brightest X-ray source in the sky. And uh, that was the very first source that, that, that was discovered. It's actually an X-ray binary. Um, uh, the moon had to wait until 1990 to be seen in X-rays. And this is a very interesting image from ROSAT, which is um, a mission that was led by uh, the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, um, where you can see a number of interesting things. You can see, indeed, the uh, sunlight reflected on the bright side of the moon, uh, very much as we see in the optical. But you can also see that the dark side of the moon is darker than the background, meaning that the X-ray sky is bright. And this is exactly the X-ray background that was discovered by this very first rocket flight uh, that uh, Ricardo Giacconi and Bruno Rossi and others um, launched in 1962. So this was actually a very nice image when it was uh, released in, in uh, 1990. Um, this is a bit a brief history of uh, the facilities that we have been using in X-ray astronomy since 1962. As I said, there were a few other rockets that were flown during that decade with detectors. In the 70s, um, there were the first really orbiting observatories um, in, in space. Those lasted not for minutes, but for years doing observations. Um, they had a very rudimentary imaging capabilities called collimators that I will talk about in a minute um, with an angular resolution of the order of several degrees. So that was uh, the, the uh, sharpest of the X-ray images at the time. In the 80s, uh, the first soft X-ray telescopes were put in orbit, in particular Einstein and Exosat. Uh, they were really imaging telescopes, and I will explain how imaging um, is done at X-ray wavelengths. In the 90s and until today, uh, we had a much more powerful set of X-ray telescopes that, they were, that were able actually to focus not only uh, X-rays below, let's say, one or two kilo electron volts, but up to 10 or a little bit more kilo electron volts, what we call hard X-rays. And uh, that includes our two workhorses today, which are uh, Chandra and XMM Newton, which are major um, missions from NASA and, and ESA. And also ROSAT, which I already mentioned, and that uh, actually it, it was an, an, a telescope that did an all-sky survey at soft X-rays. I'll come back to this in a minute. So this was uh, the first orbiting uh, telescope, uh, sorry, the first orbiting X-ray mission. Um, it was launched in 1970. It was called Uhuru. Um, the payload, uh, the scientific instrument, weighted 56 kilograms, uh, very light compared to the tons that we fly these days. It scanned the full sky at a resolution of several degrees, and it found um, um, of the order of um, 100 sources or so, um, which included X-ray binaries and bright AGMs, but mostly X-ray binaries, supernova remnants, and, and so on. So that was the first picture that we had of the X-ray sky. Um, this is the Einstein Observatory that, as I said, it was the first really uh, focusing, X-ray focusing optics um, telescope. Uh, it had uh, four instruments. Uh, one of them, the most um, uh, yeah, used one, the most powerful one, was the imaging proportional counter. It was a gas proportional counter. I will show you what this means. Um, the spatial, the angular resolution was still rather poor, but much better than the collimators. We're talking about uh, 90 seconds of angular resolution. For X-rays, that was great. Um, the uh, um, spectral resolution was rather poor. We can only determine the energy of every individual X-ray photon to an accuracy of about 50%. It had another instrument called HRI um, of a different kind, which had a much better um, um, angular resolution, but basically no spectral information, no even color information. Um, uh, Einstein had also another two novel uh, instruments that um, uh, were basically to do very high resolution spectroscopy, but 
this was actually limited to one or two sources and also a Bragg crystal spectrometer that was a proof of concept that actually polarimetry could also be observed in, in X-rays. Um, Einstein was the first um, um, telescope that was, was capable of doing um, deep X-ray surveys and it was actually um, um, a very important handle to resolve this X-ray background and break it down into pieces um, and contributions from individual sources, in particular active galactic nuclei and quasars. Uh, ROSAT, as, as I said, it was uh, led by uh, Germany in collaboration with the UK. Uh, it lasted for about a decade. It, it was launched, I believe, on the 2nd of June of 1990, if I remember rightly. And the one thing that it did during the first six months was an all-sky survey. And what we can see um, on your right-hand side is, is essentially a picture of this, of this all-sky survey um, in X-rays, where you can see um, that uh, it, this is in galactic coordinates, that uh, when you look towards the galactic centrum, you don't see much. Um, and this is because of absorption. That's not uh, terribly different to what happens in the optical where, of course, we see the Milky Way, but uh, what we see is our immediate vicinity, not the center of, of the galaxy. Uh, but it, uh, it discovered something like 60,000 sources and provided the first old sky catalog in, in X-rays, which has been extremely helpful uh, for uh, many investigations in the X-ray sky. Um, in, in the remaining of the mission uh, lifetime, it was dedicated to the pointed observations and it, this included very deep surveys, which again helped enormously to understand uh, the secrets of the deep X-ray sky. Those are the two current workhorses, uh, Chandra, uh, which is a NASA mission. It contains one single very large telescope uh, focusing X-rays and <clears throat> four instruments in, in the focal plane. It was launched in 1999, same year that uh, XMM-Newton, the ESA mission was launched as well. So they are aging, as you know, but they are quite powerful still. And um, they complement each other in, in, uh, in the sense that Chandra has a superb um, uh, angular resolution. In, it can uh, reach uh, half an arc second on axis, while XMM-Newton, which has a modest angular resolution of the order of 12 arc seconds, it collects many more photons and then it's much better suited to do um, X-ray spectroscopy. Those are, I would say, the workhorses of today's X-ray astronomy. Now, uh, about a year ago, this other very interesting mission um, uh, called uh, Spectrum X Gamma, um, which contains two uh, telescopes. Uh, one is called E Rosita. This is led by Again, my uh, neighbors here in Germany, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Um, this is a mission to survey the entire X-ray sky at a much deeper level than ROSAT and also reaching um, uh, higher uh, X-ray energies. So um, being sensitive to energies of up to 10 keV or so, Irosita is also capable of unveiling, for example, um, um, uh, obscured active galactic nuclei. Um, I have to say that I was uh, shocked and, and you know, very, very happy when I saw this, this first all sky map delivered by Irosita just a few weeks ago, um, uh, where it, it actually contains about a million sources. It's 1.1 uh, million sources. Um, the uh, breakdown is that about three quarters are active galactic nuclei. Uh, there's about 20% of stars and only a tiny fraction of clusters, about 2% of these sources, but this is precisely the main target of this mission. I mean, the, the objective here is to be able to do cosmology with a cluster, uh, with clusters of galaxies, looking at uh, uh, the, the number density as a function of redshift and, and other features of this of these sources and um, uh, okay so this this mission took a long time to be uh, put into orbit but it's it's working very very nicely and delivering uh, lots of of, uh, of data that uh, will, will shed light on into many aspects of x-ray astronomy and as I said this is today it already has uh, 
identified or singled out 1.1 million sources and this number will will increase uh, a little bit because it will go deeper by doing the same survey during um, a number of semesters. Okay, um, so let me, as I said, I tailored this this uh, presentation mostly for engineers. Um, I mean, sometimes people are surprised, but in, in the headquarters of ESO in Garking, half of our staff are engineers actually. And, and this is the people that I, I want to convince that uh, working for ESO, it's you know, a very important challenge. And, and that's why I also explained to them the challenges that underpin uh, this other type of astronomical observations that we do in, in X-rays. So um, let me talk a little bit about X-ray telescopes first. As I mentioned before, the most rudimentary version of an X-ray telescope is a collimator. This is basically a box, it's a tube, it's a metal tube where you limit your field of view by just blocking the entrance of X-rays to your detectors from directions which are uh, far away from the aim point of, of the telescope. So you can actually mimic a collimator by a, a set of, of boxes or tubes with metal walls and uh, of course that only limits as I say the um, uh, photons that come from outside of this place. Typically if um, I mean uh, unless you build extremely long and narrow tubes uh, the uh, angular resolution of these devices is of the order of several degrees. And, and that is what Uhuru, for example, achieved and, and a number of other missions. It's not really an imaging device. Well, I mean, it is an imaging device, but it's not a focusing device. X-rays are not, not focused, they're just blocked from here. Um, now, focusing X-ray, focusing X-rays is not a particularly easy task. This is a small simulation where you can see this um, um, yellow things which are meant to be X-rays if they uh, go through a mirror in normal uh, direction they are just absorbed they are never reflected to reflect x-rays you need a grazing incidence you need to uh, make them uh, bounce out of a surface which is almost parallel to the uh, aim point and this is the way x-ray telescopes work you focus x-rays by grazing incidence by making them reflect into a surface, into a reflecting surface, which is almost parallel to the direction of observation. That means that um, this is uh, the efficiency in this focusing is very low because, uh, I mean, to make these things efficient, you normally want to put your mirror uh, perpendicular to the uh, aim point. But of course, if you do this in exercise, it just doesn't work. So that's the way X ray telescopes are built these days. Uh, sorry. Uh, next, yeah, okay. Um, that depends very much on the uh, the reflectivity. Depends very much on the material that uh, covers the reflecting surfaces. Your mirrors, right? Um, uh, on the left hand side, you can see uh, the various um, metals that are normally used. Uh, metals or other um, materials. Uh, gold has been typical. Nickel as well. Aluminum a bit less. Beryllium. And um, now this, what you have in here is the critical grazing angle. This is the maximum angle at which you can't reflect an X-ray. And uh, this is a function of energy, as you can see, and also a function of the element that you're using to code your, your surfaces. And, and you can see that at energies between one and 10 keV, we are essentially down to one degree field of view. This is the maximum field of view that that you will, you will normally achieve with an X-ray focusing telescope. It is very difficult to go beyond that, especially at high energies. On, on the right hand side, you can see a, a different uh, way of presenting this. This assumes a gold coated uh, reflecting mirror. And if you go to one keV, which is 10 to the three electron volts, you will see um, here that uh, at uh, half a degree, uh, the reflectivity it's about 90 percent um, but <clears throat> at, at two degrees the reflectivity has dropped already 2.5 percent so two lessons to be learned from here uh, x-ray focusing optics means that the field of view depends on the energy of the photon 
the field of view is always smaller for higher energy photons and that overall this number is relatively small your field of view is always going to be of the order of a few tens of arc minutes at best um, the optical design in x-rays to make an image you always need two uh, reflections this is i'm being told it's basic optics um, and uh, this is the way that most of the x-ray telescopes are designed and built you have two uh, uh, um, uh, quadrical surfaces, normally a paraboloid and a hyperboloid. This is the most popular design. It's called Walter One, and uh, this is the way this this works. You make uh, the X-rays focus twice: once in the paraboloid, the other one in the hyperboloid. Depending on your design, um, you can uh, you can make an approximation of those surfaces to to flat, and then you have what we call a conical. Uh, design that uh, degrades a little bit the uh, angular resolution, but depending on on your setup, it, this this can be tolerated. Um, now, as I mentioned before, uh, this is very inefficient. The effective collecting surface of these mirrors, which are put almost parallel to the uh, income direction of the axis, is very very small. So, uh, to increase the collecting surface, what uh, most of these telescopes do is to nest some of these mirrors inside each other. Uh, what you have on your right hand side is um, a sketch of the uh, XMM-Newton, one of the three telescopes of XMM-Newton, which has a focal length of seven and a half meters. That means that this is the distance at which you focus uh, the X-rays and where you put your detectors. And what you do to increase the effective area is to put lots of these mirrors, one, one inside each other. Uh, each uh, of these uh, three telescopes in XMM Newton has 56 of these nested mirrors, and in this way, you achieve um, a relatively decent X ray uh, collecting surface. And now, uh, this is one critical aspect. The other critical one is the angular resolution, as you can imagine. Um, Chandra, which is the NASA uh, workhorse today, has uh, basically a zero door um, substrate. Um, and uh, then it can achieve a very good angular resolution, especially on axis. I mentioned this number before, it's about half an arc second. Of course, the way to achieve that is uh, by putting a very stiff um, substrate. In this case, it's zero dure, and then the mass is huge. Don't forget that we have to put this in space, and mass in space is very, very expensive and very difficult. XMM Newton has um, um, a worse. Um, uh, angular resolution, it's only 14 arc seconds, and it's because it has a substrate made of nickel uh, that's lighter. That means that XMM Newton can afford to put more of these mirrors into space and collect lots more photons. But of course, the trade off here is that you get more photons with less angular resolution. And on the right hand side, you, had the, uh, you have the current uh, technological developments. Uh, which are act, actually slammed glass. This is uh, uh, glass, essentially. Um, and on uh, the further right, you have silicon pore optics. This is the one that Athena will, will use. Those are silicon plates, like the ones that are used for microelectronics, um, which are of very good quality and very light. So you can actually focus X-rays with a very good uh, angular resolution of the order of a few arc seconds with a very low mass um, per square meter. And this is the preferred option uh, for Athena, which is the mission that we're working on um, um, uh, at, at ESA. Now, uh, this is the telescope. This is what you get to um, collect the photons and, and form an image. Now you have to put the detector um, um, at the focal plane. And um, I have to say here that at the difference uh, for what happens in, in most optical instruments, uh, what we do in X-rays and also, of course, in the radio band, what we do differently is that we measure the energy of every single individual X-ray photon. So we detect individual X-ray photons, we position this photon, we know at which place of the detector it landed. So that is the way we form the images. But we also measure the position, sorry, the energy of this, this photon. And this is what gives normally um, the spectral dimension into this. So in, in this 
In this way, uh, most of the X-ray detectors are actually equivalent to IFUs, to integral field units, as we used in, in, in the optical wave band. Um, it is also important in X-ray astronomy because uh, most of the X-ray sources are highly variable to record the arrival time of these uh, photons. And, and this, is, this is something that it's also done in virtually all the devices that we use today for, <clears throat> uh, for X-ray astronomy observations. Of course, uh, uh, the key performance parameters um, of our detectors are the pixel size, the smaller the better, or at least matching the performance of the telescope that is important. The field of view, the bigger the better, but don't forget that we have limitations there, especially at high energies. Time accuracy, this is particularly important for galactic black holes, X-ray binaries and so on, because the, the, the time variability of the sources is really, really very short. Um, the readout speed, uh, it's linked to that. Uh, the spectral energy resolution, that's of course critical to do um, astrophysics. The quantum efficiency, it doesn't help if you fly a fantastic telescope and the detector that doesn't see any of the photons. And also very important in space is to reduce the background as much as possible. All the background created by particles, it's, it's especially um, difficult and it, it makes our life um, um, uh, very difficult sometimes. So if we, uh, if we want to have a perfect detector, it would maximize all these parameters on the right hand side and as you can imagine no such detector exists some of them have better performance in terms of some of these key performance indicators and others focus on other parts of parameter space so those uh, these gas proportional counters those were the first ones that had any um, uh, capability of doing imaging in particular uh, you have on the right hand side the one that was used by rosat uh, that was called the proportional um, um, uh, point, position sensitive proportional counters. Uh, they were using um, gas actually, uh, so it, they had a chamber uh, filled with uh, a, a noble gas. Um, and when a photon entered that chamber that had anodes and, and the cathode at the bottom, it ionized the gas, it produced a cascade of electrons that were detected by the cathode and, and measured. That was the way. X-rays were detected in those days. The spectral resolution was not great. Uh, I, you know, um, if you compare this to the optical or to the radio band, this is a joke. Um, but at least we could get some colors. We could get uh, of the order of, um, yeah, 20 to 25 percent um, accuracy in measuring the energy of every individual X-ray photon with this uh, with this type of device. And that's where uh, on that's the instrument that actually did the this first all all sky X-ray survey that Rosa did in the 90s. Okay, um, I also mentioned these microchannel plates that were used, and Chandra still has one of those. By the way, they are photomultipliers. They are very narrow tubes, which are also electrically loaded. Um, and what happens is that when you have an X-ray uh, impacting on the wall of this metal tube it it produces a cascade it is operated in a way that it produces a saturated cascade at the end this this is very helpful to produce a very highly accurate position of the incoming x-ray photon but of course all the information uh, about the energy of this incoming x-ray photon is lost because you are operating the device at, at saturation um, that was the, um, uh, the instruments that were used and, as I say, Chandra still uses uh, to achieve the highest positional accuracy of, of the X-ray photons. But uh, the trade-off is that you lose all the spectral uh, dimension. Now, the, the workhorse today are the CCDs. Uh, those CCDs are like the ones that we have in our mobile phones and like the ones that most of our um, optical instruments have, except that they operate it differently. Uh, what happens here is that um, every X-ray photon um, brings a huge number of electrons from, uh, uh, to the conduction bands of, of the semiconductor. Uh, huge meaning thousands of them. And 
this number of electron hole pairs that are created in this CCDs, it's proportional to the energy that the um, X-ray photon deposited in the device. In this way, we can then uh, operate the CCD in a way that it allows us to measure also the energy of the incoming X-ray photon with an accuracy which is starting to get interesting um, of the order of a few percent. So we can actually measure the, uh, the energy of every individual X-ray photon with this CCDs operated um, in this way to an accuracy of typically, you know, 5% uh, or 10%. Or so that, that actually opened the new dimension into X-ray astrophysics and that, that, that was very, very good. And that's, that's the type of device that um, the main instruments on board Chandra and XMM Newton are based on. Now the future, um, at least part of the future, uh, resides in this world of microcalorimeters, uh, where essentially you have a device that it's operated at a very low temperature, at a cryogenic temperature. We're talking here below a Kelvin, actually below um, even um, 100 millikelvin. And uh, these devices are normally operated in superconducting modes. This is a special type of this uh, microcalorimeter. You, you have a device uh, in the superconducting state. If there is uh, an X-ray photon that is absorbed here, it hits the device, the thermometer. Um, it basically uh, makes that the, this, this device is no longer superconducting. It, it goes into normal state. And you measure this, and um, that produces a pulse in your in your circuit, and then you can um, measure the energy of the incoming X-ray photon by how much it has upset your your, your circuit. Um, the energy spectral resolution there it is much better. You can reach uh, an accuracy of 0.1 percent, 10 to the minus three or so in in the way you measure the energy of every X-ray photon, and this is a very promising avenue, and there's a lot of effort uh, around the world developing these things. Now, I have been talking about non-dispersive spectroscopy all the time. You measure the individual photon um, energy, but we also have uh, dispersive um, um, X-ray devices where, the, the, um, uh, depending on the energy of the X-ray, the outgoing direction of the X-ray photon is different, and therefore you place a normal detector and you can measure the um, and indirectly the incoming energy of the photon. We also have that type of thing um, through diffraction, both by reflection and by transmission. And again, Chandra and XMM have uh, such detectors. Unfortunately, the efficiency of these devices is very, very small, so they can only be used to observe very bright X-ray sources. And I think I'm going to, to skip polarimetry, but um, just be aware that there's also developments and there's actually a an, an NASA mission that will fly one of these microtrack X-ray polarimeters, uh, where basically uh, what you measure is the trajectory of the electron that it's liberated when, when you absorb a photon, and the trajectory is sensitive to the polarization of the incoming X-ray photon. Now, I think I mentioned this already. Uh, this is our workhorse at ESA. It contains a, a combination of instruments. Uh, most of them use CCDs um, to do um, um, uh, low um, resolution, low spectral resolution imaging like EPIC or to do dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which is what the RGS does, and plus an optical monitor that uh, also uh, uses actually photon counting detectors. Okay, uh, now let me use my last uh, five minutes. Um, okay, uh, yeah, maybe six uh, to first walk you through the universe in X-ray very quickly. What do we observe? We observe all types of sources. Today, uh, starting with the sun, there have been missions, especially from the Japanese Space Agency to essentially target the sun as an X-ray source and to link um, the uh, coronal emission with X-ray emission in the sun that uh, provides a lot of information. I already shown um, the the moon uh, uh, comets can also be observed in 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 X-rays. 
we normally uh, see their exchange uh, charge exchange emission um, uh, very much like what happens in the poles of of jupiter and other uh, planets in the solar system we see the solar wind impacting um, in, in the uh, relatively cold uh, atmosphere and exosphere of the solar system bodies. Uh, so we see X-ray emission uh, produced precisely because the, um, uh, the wind, the solar wind, uh, uh, produces a charge exchange in those cold atoms. And that, uh, that is actually a very powerful tool to diagnose solar wind in, um, all across the solar system. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, stars, normal stars, meaning stars not in, in binary systems, most of them also produce um, um, X-rays, not in copious quantities, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, like in the case of the sun, and the processes involved are different. So what you have on the right-hand side is actually the HR diagram for normal stars and um, a synopsis of the main processes that produce X-ray emission in that type of star. So it's normally uh, active coronae, uh, winds in some cases, and accretion in the case of uh, Titori stars, for example, and, and protostars. So where we can actually see um, stars which are actually uh, very strongly embedded into obscuring uh, material. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see some of uh, this high spectral resolution spectra of some of them. Uh, uh, of some of these active stars in different phases when they flare, when they are quiescent. By analyzing these emission lines, we can actually diagnose uh, the plasma that it's, it's producing this emission. We can measure the uh, ionization state. We can measure even the density um, using um, uh, triplets, using line triplets. Um, X-ray binaries, as I mentioned, were among the first X-ray sources to be discovered by Uhuru and others. We're talking here about a compact object, a black hole, a neutron star, uh, which has um, a donor, which sits relatively close. Um, uh, there is an accretion disk, which emits uh, UV light and X-rays. Uh, there's uh, often a jet as well, which emits in a number of, of wavelengths. And, uh, and, and this is um, actually what powers um, uh, some of the most powerful um, um, sources in the uh, in the galaxy. Okay, good. Okay, great. Supernova remnants. They are also a very popular class of X-ray sources. Uh, after supernovae explode, uh, the material uh, is shocked against the interstellar medium, and it produces a lot of of X-rays. Um, the, the gas temperature of this of this gas is typically of the order of ten to the seven Kelvin. So that uh, you know, uh, X-rays is the 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 wavelength where they would emit most of their energy. Um, on the right hand side, you have um, a Chandra picture of image of the Crab Nebula, where you can see a combination of um, of the neutron star, of the pulsar, and, and in the middle, and the emission from the nebula as a result of this of these shocks. There's a lot to be learned uh, from these these images. Clusters of galaxies are also very uh, powerful emitters. Um, on the left-hand side, you have a typical galaxy cluster superposed to the optical image. Uh, what you can see in, in, in blue is the X-ray emission. Uh, X-rays are emitted in clusters because there's a lot of hot gas trapped in the potential well of the cluster. Um, this, this gas is typically, um, uh, it, it reaches temperatures of 10 to the 8 Kelvin. And, and it produces uh, X-rays through uh, Bremsstrahlung radiation and also uh, line emission. And on the uh, right-hand side, we have a very popular one, which is called the Bullet Cluster. This is two, uh, actually two clusters um, heading um, head-on uh, for a collision. Uh, the X-ray emission is, in this case, in red. And what you have in blue is the gravitational potential well. And actually, this is a very nice demonstration that uh, Gas doesn't follow, sorry, light doesn't follow gravity in, in these cases. Um, active galactic nuclei are the most popular sources of X rays uh, in the universe, as I showed before in the case of Irosita. Uh, active galactic nuclei, as you all know, they are powered by a supermassive black hole, which is a critical material um, and uh, then. Uh, 
hitting an accretion disk. X-rays actually do not normally come from the accretion disk itself, but it's reprocessed radiation in the uh, in, in in an atmosphere, in a sort of atmosphere that uh, in a corona that that surrounds the um, uh, the accretion black hole. Uh, I mean, the, as you know, the sorry, the accretion disk. The accretion disk around uh, supermassive black holes have typical temperatures of 10 to the 5 Kelvin. So X-rays are produced not there, but uh, by reprocessed radiation in the corona. Um, you have a few examples here that I like a lot. Centaurus A, which is in particular this, this uh, collage of uh, an, an optical uh, a radio and an X-ray image where you can see essentially everything that's going on there, although you cannot see the black hole in the middle. Um, and and uh, that's, that's a very nice combination of all the processes that, that occur in, in this type of source. And on the right hand side, you can see a very deep X-ray image conducted with XMM Newton in, in the Dogman hole uh, zone, where most of the objects are active galactic nuclei and the different colors are actually showing the different amounts of obscuration that this radiation suffers before leaving the source. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. I think I have shown enough of this. Let me just spend two minutes to talk about Athena, which, as uh, Isabel mentioned, it's the next big X-ray observatory that ESA is working on today. It, it is the second large um, mission of the ESA Cosmic Vision Program, and it is being it has been designed and conceived to uh, observe the hot and energetic universe, in particular, to watch and to trace how ordinary matter falls into the large scale structures that we see today in, in clusters of galaxies, superclusters, and all this type of, of large scale structures. Also, where are all the missing baryons that we know they should be there and we don't see them today. And the second big theme of Athena is how do supermassive black holes grow and how does that interplay together with uh, the uh, formation of stars in galaxies during galaxy evolution. Um, Athena will also have um, a fast uh, target of opportunity capability, so it can follow up on transient sources, uh, gamma ray bursts, gravitational wave events, etc. But ultimately, it would be um, a big uh, X-ray observatory capable obser of observing almost every type of, of uh, source in, in the universe. So, um, yeah, this is um, a few numbers about its uh, launch date, hopefully in the early 2030s. Uh, it will be put into a halo orbit around Lagrange 2, lifetime minimal four years, hopefully more. And um, the optics, it is, as I explained before, based on silicon pore optics. So those are the silicon plates that are stuck on top of each other, leaving these holes which are then um, covered with reflecting material. And the X-rays actually are focused to those uh, things in there uh, following the typical Walter One optics. Uh, the um, on-axis um, um, image uh, resolution will be very good of the order of five arc seconds. Maybe, yeah, um, if we cannot get there, um, I hope that we will get down to six at least. Um, uh, this is a very good image quality all across the field of view, which will be 30 minutes in diameter, a very large collecting, collecting area compared to Chandra and XMM, so collecting lots of photons. And um, yeah, that, that will be actually uh, the ultimate uh, X-ray deep uh, X-ray sky observatory. It will have two different instruments in the focal plane, one which is basically an imaging device, which is called the white field imager. This is mostly uh, done to do surveys, very deep surveys, um, and, and reaching out to very early high redshift uh, supermassive black holes out to redshift of eight or 10. Um, this is an instrument based on, on silicon detectors. And the other one, it's this one, the XIFU, where uh, the team that I, I uh, worked on in, in, in Cantabria for many decades uh, working on. This is actually uh, an IFU um, based on superconducting devices. It's a cryogenic 
instrument uh, that comes with a number of challenges, as we all know, but uh, it should be able to measure the individual energy of every X-ray to an accuracy of uh, the order of 0.2% uh, or so. And uh, being also an imaging device, it should be able to produce maps like this one that you have on top. Um, this is a velocity map of, of a cluster of galaxies as simulated using um, normal cosmological um, uh, simulating uh, simulator uh, parameters. And you can see the gas falling in, the gas falling out, etc. So very powerful instruments. And of course, um, compared to the current capabilities, which are shown here in blue, um, uh, the, the figures of merit will be, you know, at least 10 times better on any thing that you can imagine in parameter space. So it will really open a new uh, era in X-ray astronomy. And uh, the good news is that this is actually my last slide. Thank you very much. I will be happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you very much, Javier. Now we have the, the I mean, clapping missing. That, that's the weird thing in, in these online things. But anyway, I, I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Yeah. So just for questions, please, if you can raise your hand in the small window for participants in the Zoom application. And then I see that you raise your hand and, and, and I give you word. Uh, if there's someone. And um, I, I have a question myself. It's, a, I mean, Athena would be great. Uh, we all expect to have it. it, it it'll be for about the time in, in which uh, most of us will be retired. So um, that's a message for young people. So um, just to yeah. take the, um, hmm? yeah, but my, my, my question was concerning the um, spatial resolution because uh, everything will be better except in that, right? Because Chandra was great, was smaller mm. than one second. Yeah. But we won't have that with, with uh, Athena, so... Um. No, that's true. That, that is true, but I mean, I, um, the um, spatial resolution of Chandra of uh, half an arc second, this is really only on axis. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you, when you go slightly off axis, it degrades very, very rapidly. Uh, so if you want to take an image of an extended object, um, then uh, Chandra is not that great. That, that, mm -hmm. is, the, that is the problem. That's, that's by design. I mean, you, you, can, you can achieve um, very good uh, uh, spatial resolution in, in, in the center of the field of view at, uh, and the price you have to pay is that it degrades very rapidly. Actually, in Rosita, it's an interesting example because it's a survey instrument. They decided to degrade the um, resolution at the um, at the optical axis because they wanted to have an average uh, resolution a special resolution which is much better and they did that on purpose so uh, the on axis resolution of Rosita is not as good as it could be given the telescope but it was the focus slightly so you can you can have an average uh, uh, special resolution which is which is better on mm -hmm. average but yes, this is true. I mean, five arc seconds is the best we can aim and still collect a significant amount of photons. Mm -hmm. this, uh, NASA is working on uh, other ideas for after Athena using uh, active optics uh, in X-rays, which may eventually deliver better performance in that, that parameter. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There is a question here in the chat made by Yu Dong. Is there any strategy of target of opportunity on Athena? Use it on Athena like Swift? Uh, okay, so um, Athena normally, and unless it has been included recently, it does not uh, include a um, way on board to detect automatically transients. I mean, at some point that, that was being thought about. Uh, so Athena will react to targets of opportunity. And there are very stringent requirements on reaction time and all these things. So this will be helpful. But uh, the trigger for this, this uh, transients will not come from Athena itself. This is a difference with, with SWIFT. 
that's that's a very important difference. But uh, the uh, requirements, the scientific requirements for Athena, it's uh, such that uh, we will be able to follow up within a question of hours, um, a, a good fraction of the time, any transients that that we we receive uh, from um, yeah a big parts of the sky as well. Okay, I think it's one answer. Any other I, question? I have another question myself. In fact, is the um, I think I've already heard that, but I forgot. What, what's the, the policy for the data uh, with e Rosita? Because of, I mean, they, the, we, there are already uh, a bunch of objects hmm. uh, with data, but how, how can they be used? That's an interesting question. I can give you an answer because three weeks ago, cycling back home from ESO, I found Professor Trumper sitting on a bench and I asked him, <laughs> interestingly, so uh, the sky is divided in two parts. One part is Russian, the other part is German. The Russian part, forget about it. Uh, the, the, the German part, I cannot remember the exact uh, date, but the data will become public. It's, it's sometime after it had been received. And I think it's probably uh, three years or something like this. Uh -huh. and it, will, it will become public you know, on, okay. on a semester-based uh, um, um, uh, basis. So the data that I showed to you, this will become fully accessible to everyone, fully calibrated. I don't know exactly at what point. And then all, all the rest will come six months after six months. But that does not apply to the Russian data. And, and the sky is divided in two. I believe it's not north-south this time. It's east-west. Mm. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. More questions to, to Xavier? Here, there is a question by Pepa. Hi, Javier, how are you? Hello, Pepa. Very well. It's very nice that you give us uh, this interesting, very interesting talk and also pushing the young people to use Athena. Yeah. I have a question concerning Athena. Uh, if the, there are technical reasons why you cannot reach uh, higher energies uh, above uh, 12K? Yes, uh, yes, there, there, there is a, yeah, there's a limitation there, which is the focal length and therefore the size of the satellite. So, uh, as I explained at the beginning, uh, the reflectivity of anything to X-rays decreases dramatically when you increase energy. So, uh, you can only do better if you put your, your uh, detectors further away, if you focus your X-rays at, um, at a much longer focal distance. Um, that would either imply that our satellite, the size of the telescope and the detectors will have to be much bigger, which is not possible with the current um, um, uh, launchers, or that you fly the telescope and the detectors separately. That was the original idea of Zeus, where the telescope would actually focus uh, onto the focal plane, which would be 35 meters away, and uh, not physically connected to the telescope. So the two pieces would, would fly independently. This was long time ago abandoned because it was far too risky. So the ultimate limitation to the maximum energy that you can focus, it is driven by the size of the spacecraft. And that is again driven by the maximum um, size of the, uh, of, of the fairing of your rocket launcher. And do you know any any other uh, satellites uh, that are uh, people are thinking of uh, yeah. for the higher energies in order to to study the quantum thick object? Because yes, uh, there's this. Uh, yes, there, there there are ideas more in the regime of the uh, mega electron volts rather than the uh, tens of kilo electron volts, which is probably what 
you would like to have, and I would like to have to. Um, uh, yes, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that the efficiencies that you will have in those mission concepts will be good enough to study much uh, beyond uh, what we already have today with New Star. I mean, uh, New Star is really great for that purpose, but of course, you, you're limiting yourself to the nearby universe uh, to study the Compton, the Compton thing. Uh, That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Mm -hmm. well, um, well, let me ask uh, an obvious question, Xavier. What is oh, uh, the, your, your favorite object to be observed for the first time in the first observation of Athena? Cygnus A. <laughs> no, sorry, no, Centaurus A. Centaurus A. Centaurus A is upset the whole thing. <laughs> Centaurus A, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. But you or someone else will have to do this because I will be very, very retired when <laughs> Yes, I will I will also so that most of us, yes. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pepa. More questions to Xavier. Um, I'd like just to make an announcement, it's, it's not a question, because uh, Xavier already accepted the, our invitation for a Severo Troa Colloquium in person, that it's connected to, uh, to a, a big thing that will, be, will, be, that will take place here in Granada, so it was consult, but it, we, it will hopefully take place next uh, autumn, so it, uh, we expect him here in Granada in for um, I don't know where exactly when, but um, then he will talk about ISO, right? Yes, so. uh, I think I can give you the date already. I, uh -huh. I think it is offline. Yeah. Okay. So I think that, it's something like twenty seventh of September or twenty eighth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that twenty one. Sorry. Twenty one. <clears throat> yes. That'll be the the um, I mean the ideal op opportunity to. Uh, to go on asking questions related or not with X-ray astronomy. Yeah, my pleasure to be there. <laughs> so we, we thank you very much for accepting. Thank you very time. much. Yeah. Okay. If there is no more question, I will stop recording now and then we can keep talking. <laughs>